We begin a new series of sermons and life group lessons this week that we are calling Survivors. And this was an idea that Jody came up with back in the spring, unfortunately, when the coronavirus uh, first came into our parts. Uh, she was in hopes that by this time in the fall that this whole thing would be behind us by now. And we wish Jody's prediction had come true and the pandemic was over and we could put this whole thing away, but it looks like we might be dealing with this uh, for a little while longer. However, that being said, that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't be grateful that we have survived thus far. Amen? Because it's 230-some thousand people in this country who have not, and uh, we, need to, we need to thank the Lord for uh, His blessings in bringing us through this. Some of us have actually acquired the coronavirus uh, through this season, and the Lord brought us through, and I'm certainly thankful that, uh, that He did and that that's behind me. I'm hoping that means uh, I'm a one and done. Uh, the doctors have said that's not necessarily the case, and they've still told me to be careful. We've had others in our congregation that have contracted as well. In fact, I got, uh, I got the virus uh, the, the last week of August, and my wife and I's anniversary is August 27th, and for her anniversary present is I shared my coronavirus with her this year. She's watching online. You're welcome, Lynn, and uh, I love you, and I share everything with you. Everything of mine is yours, everything, everything. And uh, so I, we need to be thankful and pray for those who are struggling through it too, amen? We understand some people don't have any symptoms, no problems. I did pretty well. I had two bad days and nights. Uh, they were bad. They, they were bad, but only two. And I thank the Lord I was done after those, uh, those two. But now there are some that are the long haulers. You know, they're in this thing for months, and, uh, and sometimes in ICUs for months, too. And so we need, we need to be remembering them as well. However, that being said, it does not mean that we shouldn't be grateful that the Lord has allowed us to survive at least so far. Can everyone say that, so far? All right, I hope that's your attitude uh, because James tells us very clearly in his book, we that would make long-term plans. Oh, boy, what is your life? What does James say your life is like? Is this like a vapor, a smoke that appears for a short time and then vanishes away? We, we really don't have any, uh, not near the control anyhow, that we think we have uh, over our lives. But so far, uh, the Lord has allowed us to survive, and we've probably learned a thing or two in the process. For instance, I've made a short tag list of some things that I have learned uh, through this coronavirus season, and maybe you've learned them too. I'll try to include you, but many of us have rediscovered the room in our house called the kitchen and what's supposed to happen in there now that it's so risky to eat out. Uh, more and more people have returned to the kitchen and, uh, and meals that are supposed to be prepared there. In fact, I don't know if you saw it this last week or if you follow the market, but the biggest gainer in Wall Street this week was what company? Any, anybody remember? Anybody? Someone in the first ser service knew. Rubbermaid. Rubbermaid quadrupled their worth in one week this week because so many people are rediscovering those plastic boxes and how precious leftovers are because of what we've had to return to in the kitchen. Now, there are others that are still rebelling against all that work that uh, is supposed to happen in that room, and they've discovered companies like Grubhub and DoorDash and Uber Eats. Now, I've, I've never done this yet, but do we have anybody here that's tried any of these services that they say right now in America, one out of every five Americans have have tried these services where you have door deliveries of meals to your house. Uh, some of us have actually broken down and learned how to do our own baking. We're making our own bread again. Now, some, some of you never left that skill, but some of us, you know, that's something that grandma did, <laughs> and now we're learning how to bake our own uh, bread once more. Uh, some of us are learning how to do online banking. 
Now, I was really slow to this until the pandemic set, and some of you young people are probably saying, what's so special about that? We've been doing that for years. But you know, I was one of them old timers, and I was afraid to put my numbers out online, and, and I, know I wasn't trusting. And now I'm sitting at the kitchen table taking pictures of checks and depositing it in my account. And then they're emailing me a bill, and I'm hitting a button that says pay it. I don't know who pays it, but it says pay it, so I pay it. And uh, maybe you're, you're paying it for me. If you are, thank you. But, uh, you know, I, I've got into the online banking thing. I'm not sure I ever would have done that had it not been for the coronavirus. Uh, most of us have, have discovered just how really important the Internet is through this uh, pandemic. And we have folks online right now watching. We miss you. We, we pray for your safe return when you can safely uh, do so. But you're blessed to have the Internet at home and, um, and, and that is a great, great blessing that maybe some of us have taken for granted. There are some students who had to learn how to learn how online. that make any sense? We used to learn in-house, in person, from a real person. And now we've got students today, no, they have to relearn how to learn online. Uh, some of us have had le- how to learn how to do our work online or at home. In our home, Lynn and I had to learn how to cut our hair. All right? I don't know what you think of my haircut. As soon as I got done in the early service, I sat down beside Lynn, and she spit on her hand and went like this in my head. (laughs) So I guess it wasn't all exactly like she wanted it to look like, but she does try. She does everything back here, and I do everything up here, and it is what it is. Uh, But that's just just a new skill, I guess, we've acquired uh, from this time we've gone through. Uh, There are those, uh, and you may be one here, but there are those who've lost work where their their work has been drastically reduced. And they've had to learn how to live on a drastically reduced income. Now, there's a lot of us, our income didn't change. And I thank the Lord that you continued to pay me through this pandemic. It's been a blessing. But there are those that did not continue to receive an income or had to live on a drastically reduced income. Most of us have had to learn a whole new list of acronyms Uh, Maybe you knew these. I did not before uh, the pandemic. The acronym SARS, or what is a PPE? What is a PPP? What is the CDC? Who in the world is the HWO? You know, for me in my generation, the HWO was a singing group, the WHO. Out of my high school days, we remember the WHO, uh, but no, it's the World Health Organization now. It took some doing, but most of us have learned how to uh, offer fist bumps and elbow bumps instead of handshakes and hugs. We may not like it, but at least now we're, we're starting to do it. And we've learned to begin recognizing one another behind these frazzling face masks. No one likes them, but it looks like we're going to have to live with them. And... Uh, and we're, we're starting to do so. I, I've still not learned how to wear a mask and keep my glasses from fogging at the same time. Everybody, everybody's given me all these hints. I've tried every one of them. And Shep, yours, Roger, you told me to smear potato juice on the lenses of my glasses. And knowing who you are, I've not tried that, that trick yet to see if that would work. Uh, it probably would keep my glasses from fogging, but I'm not sure I'll be able to, to see anything uh, here this morning. But surviving this pandemic has caused us to learn some things, hasn't it? Maybe some things we, we didn't want to know, but now we do. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next three or four weeks together, both in this room and in our life groups that meet in all kinds of rooms all through the week. We're going to learn by comparing our survivorship to those who survived the greatest catastrophe, catastrophe this world has ever seen, and that is the worldwide flood. Now, that's recorded in our Bibles in four chapters, Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. I'd encourage you to go home and read that. Uh, Maybe over the next four weeks, continue reading those chapters. I've been trying to read them every day, Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9, because there are some incredible lessons to be learned from that record of the greatest catastrophe 
this world's ever seen. And what the survivors say they learned after coming through that. And the first lesson is this. It's absolutely startling how evil people can be. It's absolutely startling how evil we can be. Our text this morning tells of a time just prior to the flood in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, when the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Well, how great was it? It was so great that the Lord saw that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There was not a thought upon the earth that was not an evil thought. And folks, that's about as wicked as people can become. Now, you may have played a game at the roller rink or out on the dance floor that was called uh, Limbo. You remember the game Limbo? And the game was won by saying, how low can you go? Well, this was about as low morally as people could go. Advancing to the point, think of this, the world had reached such a low point in its wickedness that the Lord would say, no more, it's over. And he would wash his hands of the very place he had made. Now, this is very much like the time that God told Moses to step away from God's people. Now, they were God's people. But God told Moses, step away from my people. They've become too evil. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, Moses, leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I might make a great nation of you. God was done with his people and truly ready to wipe the earth of them and start all over again because their wickedness had progressed to the place that even God said, there's no fixing them. Have you ever worked on a project that went so badly that there was just no fixing it? And you just had to scrap that that whole project and start all over again. Now, some projects you can kind of make shift and change and brace. But some projects just go so badly. You just have to start all over again. That's where God was, with us, with his people in Moses' day. Get away from him, Moses. i got to start all over again. I'll start with you, but you move away from him. I'm done with him. That's how God was with his people in Noah's day. Folks, you've got to see how evil, from God's perspective, this world can be. Or he's just done with it. And remember, remember, these were his people, God's people. These are God's people that God created in the Garden of Eden. And these were God's people that God later led out of the land of Egypt. And now God's ready to wash his hands of them. Verse 6 says, And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. Now, the Hebrew word regretted there comes from a word that means to breathe heavily. We would say to sigh over something that brings you great sorrow. 
Now, this word is actually used twice in those two verses back to back. In verse 6, it says, The Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So much so that verse 7 says, So the Lord said, I'll blot out man from whom I created from the face of the land, man, animals, creeping things, birds of the heavens, for I am... I am sorry that I even made him. And there's our word again. Mankind had become so wicked that God just shook his head. And wish he'd never made us. It's truly heartbreaking. It's truly heartbreaking how deeply we can disappoint God. Verse 6 says, It grieved him to his heart. So much so that God said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth. I just get rid of him. Everything that God had said was good or very good back in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Everything that God had plans to do in Genesis chapter 3, God was re now ready to wash away. I will makah is the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew word, makah. I will wipe it away from the face of the earth. The New International Commentary says this verb comes from a root word that means to erase by washing, by washing. Some of you older ones may remember this. Most of our younger ones probably not so much. But through the rubbing and through the washing, God was going to rid the earth of this stain on his creation. I know in the day of automatic washing machines, some of this imagery is, is lost. But back in the day when stains were only washed away with great effort by rubbing up and down a washboard or against a well-placed stone, the effort that God is said he's willing to go to to scrap his whole Garden of Eden experiment would have been more clearly seen. God is so truly heartbroken. He is so deeply disappointed with his creation that you can see him in this verse rolling up his sleeves and pulling out his washboard, grabbing his bar of soap. He is going to take whatever effort it takes to dispense of this stain called mankind from his creation once and for all. He's done with it. He's going to blot it out. And if you don't see the length that God says he'll go to in this verse, when he says, I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land, let me just say that this is the same word that God's going to use later when he says, I am he who blots out your transgressions. The same effort that God is willing to go to to erase your sin is the same amount of effort God is willing to go to to erase sinners from his creation. It's absolutely startling from God's perspective how evil his creation could become. And it was truly heartbreaking how deeply mankind had disappointed God. Mankind had progressed, if you can call it that. We had progressed from eating a piece of forbidden fruit. Remember that? That was our first sin. We, we just ate a piece of forbidden fruit. And within one generation, brother is killing brother. And from there, if you read... Genesis 4 and 5, things quickly go downhill. The practice of polygamy is brought to the earth. Never God's intention. God said he was bringing the woman to the man, and for this reason, 
the man would leave his father and mother and be joined together with his wife, and the two should become how many? One flesh. But by Genesis chapter 4 and 5, polygamy had already propagated upon the earth. And then homicidal mania. And violence became so severe, we're told, that God had to limit the number of years a mankind could live upon the earth. And then we're told in Genesis 6, we had progressed to the place where there was a worldwide preoccupation with evil continually to the point that only the nuclear option was left. Mankind had to be eradicated from the earth. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, so great that every, every thought continually, nothing but evil, and the Lord regretted, regretted he ever made man. So the Lord said, I'll blot man whom I created from the face of the land. Man, animals, creeping things, birds of the heaven, for I am, I am sorry I even made them. But, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Folks, it's incredibly amazing how graceful God can be even in the midst of our guilt. Of all the things such a disappointed God could do, God chooses one man. one family to survive and carry on. A man that the very next verse will say was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, which says a lot considering what God thought of that generation. And then it says he was a man who walked with God. Those are incredible descriptions. Man, wouldn't you like for yourself to be described by descriptions like that? Especially of a man who lived in as wicked times as that. I wish we had time to look at each one of those, but it's just that last description I want us to specifically key ourselves in on this morning. A man who walked with God. Where have we heard that before? We're only six chapters into the Bible, and yet somewhere... Somewhere in the Bible, I've heard that before. It was the description of Noah's great-granddad. Back in chapter 5, among the descendants of Adam is a man named Enoch, the father of Methuselah, who was the father of Lamech, who was the father of Noah. Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather. And in this early history of mankind, the Bible says Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then listen to this. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for the Lord took him. And to understand that phrase, you have to look through this repetitive statement of ten generations in Genesis chapter 5. Over and over again in this early genealogy of the descendants of Adam, we're told that each of these ten generations of men became fathers. And they lived so many years after they became fathers. And, and they had other sons and daughters. And then after a certain number of years in total, they died. Each, each man in each generation, same thing. Lived so many years, became a father. And then lived so many other years and had other sons and daughters. And then they died. Each man. All ten generations. Until we get to Enoch. When we get to Enoch, verse 24 says, Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. And the New Testament explains that to us. It says, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having 
pleased God. Just like Enoch's great grandson, Noah, who also caught God's eye in the midst of this sinful generation. And I'm going to let you and your life group struggle with whether Noah's righteousness had anything to do with God's decision to choose him and his family to be the survivors on his ark. But let me say this. This is the important lesson for us this morning. Grandma, Grandpa, we have a lot of you here. Great Grandma, Great Grandpa, we have plenty of you here. Mom, Dad, we've got you here. Never underestimate the godly or ungodly influence you have on the generations that follow you. Never underestimate that. Enoch walked with God. And the same thing is said about Enoch's great grandson. Now, what happened between Enoch and Noah, the Bible doesn't say. (laughs) Other than Enoch's son, Methuselah, lived to be the longest living man recorded in the Bible. (laughs) And Methuselah's son, Lamech, uh, he became the father of Noah. What about their righteousness? What about Methuselah's spiritual life? What about Lamech's spiritual life? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Sometimes righteousness skips a generation. Have you noticed that? It's kind of sad. But in long ministries, it's one one of the things I see is how the faith comes into a family, breaks in sometimes, and then how the faith is passed down through a family. And sometimes I see it skip a generation. It's sad, but it's true. But sometimes the faith is passed down from father to son or from mother to daughter, from grandparents to grandchildren. But be sure of this, it makes a difference. You make a difference. It sure did with Noah in the midst of a sinful generation, so much so that God was ready to wash his hands of all of it But thank God, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it appears to me he found grace in the eyes of the Lord because Noah walked with God just like great-grandpa. I feel reasonably certain that one of the only reasons I'm here to this day It's because of my grandpa Gus, whom I never met, who died before I was ever born. A Sunday school superintendent up in the Clay County Hills of West Virginia who wanted one of his seven sons to be a preacher and none of them would do it. And I truly think the faith he passed down to my father And my father passed down to me is one of the reasons Grandpa Gus has a grandson that preaches. Do you realize how close mankind came to complete extinction here? Complete. None of us would be here. That close. And we would have deserved it. Had we been first-time readers this morning of this Genesis 6 passage, if we never knew anything about Noah and the ark, hadn't seen nurseries decorated with boats and two-by-two animals going into into the ark to be spared, had we never been acquainted with this story and we'd been reading Genesis 6 for the very first time and we would have read how the Lord saw that wickedness was so great in the earth that the Lord regretted he'd ever started this whole project and had decided he's just going to blot it all out from the face, face of the earth. We would, have, we would have thought, oh my, 
It's over. How sweet would have been the next line we could have read in the Bible that says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It would have caused us all to take a deep sigh of relief because our world missed out on annihilation by that much. How many of you remember Maxwell Smart, Agent 86, from Get Smart sitcom? Remember what Maxwell Smart would say whenever he got in a tough jam? Missed it by that much. Folks, this world missed not being. by that much. Our world carries the scars of some kind of catastrophic event. We have divided continents now that encircle the globe that virtually Everyone says at one time, we're united as one. What happened to divide the continents clean around the world? We have mountains that have been pushed up from the earth until they're raised to the heavens. What, what happened that raised such mountains up? We have horizontal rock strata that somehow have been lifted up into vertical knife edges that run for miles along the earth. We have layer after layer of sediment that is just filled with incredible fossilized evidence of some time in history of an enormous death upon the earth where creatures around the globe all suddenly died and were buried. From microscopic to mammoth-sized proportions, we have skeletal remains that are embedded high up into the sides of mountains and cliffs where somehow these great animals were slammed up against the rock and met their sudden death. And there... Their skeletal remains are fossilized. How did they get there? We have saltwater fossils that can now be found thousands of miles inland in arid deserts. How did saltwater fossils be left in arid deserts? We have huge freshwater lakes carved by glaciers cutting their paths down from the north, bringing with them vegetation that doesn't belong down here in these parts. How'd it get here? We have rivers, even in our own community, that change their direction of flow. What happened here? 
We have huge freshwater seas that were opened up to saltwater oceans. And now they're saltwater as well. Something cataclysmic happened to this planet, something oceanic. About that, everyone agrees. But Christians believe they are the remnants of a time when great lessons can be learned. Lessons about how absolutely startling evil people can be and how truly heartbreaking we can deeply disappoint God. But most important, how incredibly amazing and graceful God can be in the midst of our guilt. How in that day of wickedness, when God was ready just to wipe away the whole place, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Teaching us how in this day, you can too. I hope you'll stop by our beginning point on your way out and find out how that can happen. For your sake and for the sake of all the generations that will follow you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus, our Savior, in our wicked time to save us from our wickedness. May more join us on board his ark of safety while there still is time to be saved from the coming catastrophe. We pray they would come even this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. God's people say